Well, hey there, Sarah. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Cool, cool. Well, I just want to kind of jump in real quick on some things. So I think we were just chatting about earlier, um, getting into a little bit more about you know what Hunter's AI does and then ultimately who you guys are marketing to, just to give a little bit of context for the conversation. Of course. So Hunters, uh, we are a SOC platform. Um, and those who are familiar with security will know that SOC stands for uh, Security Operations Center. Um, so this is the hub within the business that's mm -hmm. responsible for identifying and responding to threats quickly. And Hunters is a platform that helps teams do that. Very cool. So I assume that security professionals, compliance folks are the typical folks that you guys are marketing to? Yes, essentially people in security, um, incident detection and response. So not as much on the specific risk side, but people who are looking within the environment, searching all of the data to see correlations between um, different incidents that are happening uh, and making sure that the business is safe and protected at all times. Is it, a, is it a complicated motion? I mean, I think that there's a lot of SaaS companies where they've got bigger buying committees, right? And they've got all these people that they need to influence in the deal. There's the CEO, the COO, the CFO. They need to be part of it in some regard. Then there's the security folks, maybe, et cetera. Do you guys, is the selling motion like that for a lot of the sales reps where you guys have to really bring in and influence a lot of different people? Or is it a quicker motion where you can really get in with, say, a very core group, sellhunters.ai, and then move forward? Because I think that one of the things I'm curious about is how you guys approach that from a marketing standpoint. Do you approach trying to actually market a message to all of these different buyer personas? Or do you just say, you know what, like ultimately these are the core people that convert on our website and our jobs to try to get more sales conversations. How, how do you guys think about that? Because I think it's challenging. It's definitely challenging. I think any type of SaaS solution um, that's, you know, upper mid market and, and going into enterprise can be quite challenging to sell. There is um, often a big buying committee. These products are expensive. A big investment is required. And then obviously it's extremely competitive market um, in security and, and other um, industries that are out there. So the way we think about it at Hunters, we have three key personas. So starting with the end user is the security analyst, uh, the person who is kind of living inside of the platform every day, looking at the different data sources, looking at connections, um, looking at incidents, and also, um, you know, thinking about responding and investigating certain things that are going on within the business. Um, after the security analyst, we're also, uh, our second persona is the head of SOC, so the head of the security operations center, the person who is responsible for um, overseeing the security team and also you know, bringing um, best in class solutions into the business so that the team is empowered, the team can operate in a very efficient manner, and the business is also seeing ROI on these solutions. And then that person typically reports into the chief information security officer or the CISO. Um, so, you know, C-level people, uh, personas tend to always want to, you know, share their perspective on, uh, new solutions that are coming into the business. So of course they're extremely important in the buying decision. Uh, but we would usually see them, you know, either at the very beginning where they're hearing about hunters through referrals in their network and also at the end where they are kind of playing a key role in terms of signing off on uh, procurement decisions. And do you, I mean, so that makes sense. I mean, but do you market to all of them? I mean, are there like specific messages where you're like, Hey, the security analyst, it sounds like they're more in the weeds on this, right? So they really need to hear potentially a slightly different message or do you just kind of group them all together and say, hey, ultimately these are the three people that are gonna receive sort of more of a broader messaging because I think that where we see a lot of um, issues with some of the SaaS companies we work with is that we'll log into like a paid media account or even sometimes outbound email, but especially happens in paid media where the audience is very, very broad, right? And it's just wide open because they're trying to usually usually promote either a download or a webinar or something like that. They just want as many people coming into the door as possible. Uh, and they're serving the same messages a lot of the time to the same group of people. So then what you get done is sometimes a little bit of a watered down message. And I'm curious, do you guys think about segmenting those or are there clear kind of patterns between all three of those personas where there's a clear pain points that are shared between all of them and messaging is really pretty easy for those three? I've worked at a company in the past where we had completely different messages for 
different personas and in different industries. And I think it can be very, very challenging as a marketer where you are wearing your marketing hat to market to a, um, you know, a, a practitioner in financial services and also an executive in financial services. And then you're doing the same for healthcare, you're doing the same for manufacturing, uh, you know, across the board. I think that's extremely challenging and I've been there before. I'm happy to answer your question by saying that at Hunters, we're very specific and very consistent around our mes messaging. We have three key pillars within our messaging and they apply to each persona. But I think the way we tell the story is a little bit different based on the persona, because mm. obviously the, the C-level CISO persona has different concerns right. and different um, you know, motivations within their career path and also what they're responsible for in the business versus an analyst who is typically earlier in their career. They obviously care about different exactly. things as well. Um, and we would get more in depth in terms of like the nuts and bolts of the product with the more junior persona. And then with the CISO, we're thinking like bigger picture, we're thinking strategy, wow. we're thinking, you know, the, the responsibilities of a CISO, which is, you know, extremely different to mm -hmm. a junior persona. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it is it is really tough because, I mean, you know, number one, it requires having a deep understanding of what the current situation are of all of those different types of personas you're going after. And then ideally, not just messaging. And it sounds like you guys have got some core messaging with with each of those three. But then it's the content, too. And and content takes time to produce, as you know. And when you've got a small marketing team, you can't just produce mark, you know, produce content for every one of these little sub verticals, every persona. It would be a, an immense job. So a lot of times when you're an early stage SaaS company, you have to instead say, hey, we have to focus on the people that ultimately are feeling the biggest pain for what our solution can solve. Who's going to actually be coming into the website and converting so our sales team can get a chance to convert those into opportunities and focus all of our content on that. And I think that you know, Gong's a great example of this. I'm sure you know them uh, who focus predominantly on really the sales leader and all of their content is really around sales and sales leaders and it's just for them. And there are other people that are in the buying committee when Gong is purchased, yet they focused all of their energy on that, which gives them a whole lot of pull to figure out what content makes sense. So, so yeah, it's interesting. Do you guys, from a content perspective, do you, how do you end up breaking? I mean, you guys, I was looking at some stuff. I mean, obviously you guys do, you know, gated white papers and webinars, and I think I've seen some promotional posts from you guys. Um, seems like a lot of different variety in content. Is there, I, I guess I'd be kind of be curious, like what's the, What's the overall content strategy in terms of how you guys decide what to produce? And then ultimately, how do you think about distribution? Is it predominantly through paid? Is it organic? Do you like to go through email? Is it nurture campaigns on people? Like, what, is that, what does that whole flow look like? Content is a really interesting one. So I'm on the demand gen side. I'm responsible for demand generation and field marketing globally. So a really fun and interesting job. Um, I haven't come from a security background. This is my first um, startup within security. I've come from a kind of data and analytics background and also began my career in MarTech. So uh, love generating marketing type content myself, um, but I would not be generating any security content because that's not my forte. Uh, <laughs> but lucky for us at Hunters, we have yeah. you know fantastic people um, in our threat hunting team. Uh, we have security operations experts, and then mm. we have a fantastic uh, head of content who is based out of uh, Silicon Valley, who has a kind of editorial background mm. where she's contributed to Huffington Post and uh, other kind of media publications in the mm. realm of security. So we, in terms of the strategy, we have great people mm. who can create the content. Um, and then I help with the kind of amplification and ex execution of you know, delivering that content mm -hmm. to our uh, target persona within accounts that we are um, hoping to add value to. So in terms of content strategy mm -hmm. specifically, security is interesting where a lot of the content is influenced by what's happening out in the field. So we had a uh, mm -hmm. very Great. serious vulnerability that was discovered um, in December timeframe uh, called the log for J or log for shell vulnerability. Mm. So that was, you know, every security practitioner and leader had to drop whatever they were doing to focus on that vulnerability and see how their company was affected, what was affected, mm. what are the uh, remediation steps. So 
of course, uh, on the vendor side, we're helping our customers deal with that vulnerability. And we're also creating content around what are the steps to make sure you know, you're understanding where your company is affected and how mm -hmm. to resolve that. So I would say part of our strategy is very um, reactive mm -hmm. in terms of what's going on in, in the market and what's going on with our customers. Mm -hmm. And then the other side is essentially the, you know, the three kind of value pillars within our brand. So what are the pain points? Why does this company exist? Why did our mm -hmm. CEO and our CTO start this company to begin right. with? And, you know, the long and short of it is there is a le legacy product in the market. It's very, very painful to use. These are the reasons why. So we create a lot of content around that mm -hmm. and why there's kind of a new and a better way and how people can kind of evaluate solutions. Um, we are also one of the reasons why I wanted to join Hunters is our CEO is very much against the kind of scare tactics of security. You know, you need this product otherwise. Yeah something terrible is going to happen to you. Right. We are the opposite of that. We're more so <laughs> we want to empower, we want to enable, we want companies to do things better, to save money, to be faster, uh, to you know right. protect their, their assets. So those I'd say would be the two kind of pillars within our content strategy. And then we love podcasting, um, you know, which is another reason why I'm really happy to mm. be having this mm -hmm. conversation with you. We're kind of practicing what we preach on the marketing team where um, we have a mm -hmm. podcast called hands on security, which is focused at security analysts. Um, so our kind of more junior persona, the end user mm -hmm. persona. And um, so interviewing people that work within security mm -hmm. teams. So I think that's a great podcast. Yeah. Smart. Just really interesting. Smart. It's really smart. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. I think it's a huge opportunity with podcasts. I mean, there's just a huge opportunity. And then, I mean, not only that, but then you're learning an immense amount, right? So you're doing a lot of those customer interviews just on the podcast, plus getting the content creation out of it. And then I'm sure you guys distribute that out, of course, all across all the typical mediums. Do you guys also chop it up too and try to get it out on social channels and whatnot or wherever your audience is hanging out? Yeah, so I have been the, the person kind of chopping it up, slicing and dicing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yep. Going, going through right. the yeah going through the transcript i think transcript is uh, challenging for anyone listening who works in security or in any industry where you're having people speak on a podcast and english isn't their native language i think there are challenges in transcription mm, there yeah. to get things accurate and then also all sure. of the different terms in the security world these terms are being created on a daily weekly monthly basis so obviously a transcription service mm -hmm. isn't going to pick up on that um, immediately. So there's a lot of work mm. to be done there, but the content, I, I definitely recommend anyone working within a business, creating content, don't mention your product, get interesting people to contribute, mm. people who are, you know, one of your, at least one of your personas that you would sell to. I think it's one of the best ways to create content right now. I'm going to kind of jump around and go off of the little outline I made here, but in terms of the podcast, was it hard to get support to do the podcast initially, given the, the issues with attributing actual leads back to revenue and all sorts of conversations like that? Or was it a no brainer and this, everyone's just like, yeah, this makes perfect sense. We're going to get a huge opportunity to interview our customers and run this program. Was that a difficult conversation or was it pretty, pretty easy? We're really fortunate at Hunters because we work for, a CEO and a leadership team who really trust the marketing team that, that they brought in. Um, so our CMO uh -huh. comes from a cybersecurity background and she has a huge amount of credibility and success under her belt. So that's mm -hmm. really fortunate for me and others on the team where we can, we're kind of trusted to go and, and do things the way we want to do them. I, I don't think there's any pushback in terms of, um, attribution because we're not creating the po podcast to create pipeline it's really content creation mm -hmm. and i think if you're creating a pop podcast you have to consistently create the content we do our uh, practitioner mm -hmm. podcast once a month um, mainly because we just have been an extremely lean team um, so once a month you can't mm -hmm. really expect anything for a year um, and I think you really mm. need to see it as like a holistic, you're creating your brand, you're also showcasing, mm. you know, buyers, like people, end users in terms of, we sell to security analysts, our security analysts are the end user of our product. So 
it's incredible for us to hear like the value even internally to hear these people talk about what it's like to work in their role I think alone mm. is worthwhile and then the fact that we get to record that and then distribute to the outside world is a bonus well it's a huge thing what you said is that the CEO is in, in big support of it so I mean if the CEO gets marketing and, and is, is trusting of marketing because I mean in a lot of situations a lot of marketers are not in that case you know the CEO and even sometimes the CMO are saying, listen, we need to understand that there's going to be revenue that comes out of this podcast to start devoting any time, energy to cutting it all up, producing it, doing any of the editing, getting some people to help out with that, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you guys are really fortunate that because I think that it's a difficult conversation a lot of folks need to navigate where so many buyers right now are learning about companies through dark social channels. They're listening to podcasts. They're looking at organic social posts like that from personal profiles, not as much even from companies and they're in community groups, et cetera, where those things are getting shared or people will copy and paste and share out the podcast and say, hey, this is a really interesting highlight that Sarah had. And they're coming in. And a lot of times, you know, when you're looking at attribution data, they're coming either direct, organic or other channels. And one could say, oh, it's just word of mouth. Like people are just kind of hearing about us or it's SEO or other things like that. And I think it's a very difficult conversation to navigate if you don't have a CEO that's really supportive. Of yeah, I think there are other ways to measure you know the success of a podcast or even just making an argument hopefully it's not an argument hopefully it's just you know proving that it's a worthwhile investment of the people on your team um one of those things we've seen is that we have a very um talented threat hunter researcher within our team who discovered a vulnerability and is now going to be speaking at big conferences like RSA that's the biggest security conference or one of the biggest security conferences of the year. So if you think about it, you know, in the past companies and, you know, leaders, sales leaders, business leaders have been obsessed with this concept of leads and then having a funnel and then your leads contribute or uh, converting to pipeline over time. Like we've been obsessed with this old way of marketing you know, if you think about things like this person has been on our podcast, we're growing their brand, they discovered, you know, through research from their role, they discovered something that's really widely recognized and appreciated within the industry. And they're now going to sp be speaking at conferences. That is huge value for your brand. You know, I would almost say money can't buy that because I, I think it's true. Like you can buy a speaking slot but it's so much more valuable for you to earn it on merit. Mm, totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah, 100%. I think it's interesting what you said. I mean, I think that before we started recording, you were saying that marketing sourced pipeline and revenue were two key metrics for you that you guys report up to. So do you not all break it down by channel? Is there not a channel by channel focus? And that allows you to have a little more flexibility in how you leverage a channel versus saying like, hey, we need to pump X dollars into this channel and we need to get out X dollars back out of it is those aren't the conversations. It sounds like it sounds like it's more, Hey, we're going to do these types of things, distribute this content across these channels, develop our podcast, cut that up, distribute that over here, et cetera, et cetera. And ultimately what we're looking for is more inbound demo requests. And we're looking for more marketing source pipeline. And if those things are trending up, we know we're doing our job. Is that, is that kind of how the conversation goes or is it a little bit different than that in terms of metrics? So it's really interesting. And I will add more context for your listeners because I think this varies at every different every stage um, that a business is going through or, or based on the stage. So when I joined Hunters, I joined mm -hmm. we were Series A. Um, it was the beginning of April 2021, and we had we hadn't really done a lot of marketing activity. Um, Hunters started as a business like right before the pandemic, so there I wasn't coming into a company that had done. Mm -hmm all of these different trade shows and had all of this data on, you know, the different channels and what was driving revenue, it still was very much, um, you know, breaking new ground and setting foundation and, and credit to the two marketers that mm -hmm. were the first two marketing hires at Hunters. They did a fantastic job at laying down this foundation um, in terms of, you know, our CRM and all the different tools we're using and everything is very organized in the content mm -hmm. perspective. So no, they hadn't had, they didn't have a marketing leader in demand gen before I arrived. So really what last year was is getting from series mm. A to series B, we raised our series B in August. 
Um, so we had a large injection of cash. Mm -hmm. And then the mandate was, let's, let's do as mm -hmm. much as we can to gather as much data as we can. Let's see what's working. Um, but really, we're not looking at, OK, historically, this channel has driven this amount of pipeline. We, we didn't have that data. And I also think for anyone listening right now, you might this might resonate with you. Whatever data we have on things that worked in 2018, 2019, 2020, it doesn't necessarily mean that's going to work in 2022. Um, for, for many companies, especially when we think of companies that are spending a lot on trade shows and conferences. So I think that's more challenging than ever. Um, but to get closer to your question, we do look at our channels. We are going to be investing a lot more in LinkedIn advertising in 2022. We're, we're bringing on outside help to kind of help us cover more ground, help us create more ad creative, help us bring campaigns to life. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to triple our re revenue in 2022. So it's definitely not an easy task. Mm -hmm. um, we're also thinking about, you know, trade shows are very challenging. Um, some of our big trade shows for 2022 have been moved into June. Um, I hope it's not just insecurity, mm -hmm. but um, we're seeing pretty much every <laughs> week within the month of June is jam packed full of you know, in-person conference activity. So those those types yeah. of things, you know, makes it challenging when in Q1, we're still dealing with, um, you know, economic challenges around the pandemic and mar marketers are thinking, okay, if we don't have any in-person for Q1, what do we do instead? So really what we're doing is right. a mixture of virtual events that are going to be hosted by hunters. We're going to have partners involved um, we have fantastic partners like Snowflake and AWS who are helping us connect mm -hmm. with their existing customers because Hunters drives a huge amount of value on the security side um, for you know their their mm -hmm. uh, data lakes. So that's really critical. We're thinking mm -hmm. about you know creative things we can do in that sense. Um, but really, what we're seeing is when we partner with our tech partners. Um, we do very well because there's a strong shared story there. So that makes up a huge amount of, mm. um, you know, marketing and partner sourced revenue contribution. Got it. Got it. So summary there is definitely tracking those metrics and inbound, overall inbound leads, marketing source revenue, marketing source pipeline, but also of course, understanding channel by channel, how things are performing just to keep an eye on it, but ultimately not leaving that as the ultimate measure of success of the channel and how you determine Hey, how do we increase spend on, on LinkedIn? Well, we got, you know, 13 content downloads and two leads. Now we should spend more. We look at that channel as also brand awareness and hey, overall, when you started spending, doing the right things on LinkedIn, building better creative, better content, we started to see incremental increases in inbound demo requests, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. We also, we're tracking, you know, first campaign yeah. and we're tracking converting campaign within Salesforce when we can. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have an open text field on our demo form. So we're asking people yep. and we require it because we know when people can skip it, they usually will skip it. Um, but, you know, we're requiring it on our demo form. Mm -hmm. And most of the time we do get a pretty decent, insightful answer. Sometimes we don't, but hey, that's OK. Um, so I think that's one way of kind of solving for the fuzziness of attribution um like we know we can't just track it that way in salesforce and take oh this is the converting campaign that's definitely the right answer we should do more of right. that we're combining that data point with yeah. also this open text field for any demo requests we get we're also asking our sales team please when you speak um with a, a customer <laughs> or a future customer ask them how have they heard about us how are they hearing of, of us What's their perception of hunters? Like gather that information from us, from for us, and share it with us on the marketing side. Yeah. Not because we are fighting with one another over who's driving what, and that's you know I should be getting credit for this, or you should be getting credit, or we should be getting more money because of this. It's more so, you know, this mm -hmm. shared vision where we're so fortunate to have a sales leader, a marketing leader, and a partner or channel leader that all see eye to eye 
they look at one another and say, hey, what you're doing is really critical to the business. It's really important. And I enjoy working with you. What can I do to make your team more successful? Um, I think that is a complete game changer. When people are seeing eye to eye, they empower one another. And then we're looking at all of this data, not just the data, like the analytics, we're also taking like anecdotal data and feedback from our sales teams and from our customers. Combining all of that, I think is truly the answer to figuring out yeah. where you need to invest more. No, oh, 100%. Many times that, that self-reported attribution data will not match what's actually in Salesforce. And that's where it gets fun. And that's where you start saying, well, wait a minute, it says direct, it says organic over here, but what we're seeing is not the same in terms of the overall contribution here. We're seeing a lot more people saying in self-reported attribution that they came from somewhere else. So I think that's where the conversation becomes interesting and we start saying, okay, hey, we can use, let's use this data directionally, right? We're not going to, we're just not gonna use it for black and white types of decisions. This came from here, this came from there, et cetera. Um, I was going to get into one other thing too that you mentioned. So you said uh, you guys were making some decisions to invest a lot more in LinkedIn. And I'm curious why LinkedIn, what's leading to, to that decision? And then um, I know you guys have been doing some advertising on there, I believe, right? In terms of pushing out content and other things like that. But curious, like tactically, how you guys are thinking about using LinkedIn from an advertising perspective in terms of the types of content that you guys are actually sending out there? Any, any initial thoughts yet? Or is that still coming together? Yeah, I have some initial thoughts. So my my background yeah. like i've kind of grown up in this demand gen career path and one of the first things i was ever responsible for was um a linkedin advertising campaign at the first company i worked with so kind of like mm -hmm. here you go figure it out you know make it make it work here's the budget do something with it okay um and anyone who mm -hmm. uses linkedin advertising you'll know there's so many different ways to advertise um, there are expensive ways to advertise. There are less expensive ways to advertise. And there are certain ways, I think, in terms of the targeting capability, LinkedIn is second to none, especially um, for B2B. So I think all of those things mm -hmm. um, are important to factor in. What I've noticed, so at my last company, um, LinkedIn was a huge driver, especially you know during the pandemic when everything went virtual of course you turn to LinkedIn and think, yes, we need to, you know, accelerate digital. We have a huge kind of gap to fill with the world kind of turning upside down. So what we did is we had, you know, a guide for our persona that performed really, really well. And mm -hmm. we did, you know, direct response advertising where we, I was excellent at targeting. I would talk to my salespeople. I would say, Hey, you know, mm -hmm. what are the companies that you want to get meetings with? And we will, get those people in through direct response, download the ebook, um, you know, leverage an SDR as well. Mm -hmm. Somebody called them. That worked mm -hmm. really well in terms of getting the right people's contact information, but that's kind of where it mm -hmm. fell off. So we would be great at creating opportunities through direct response advertising, but those opportunities wouldn't go anywhere. And the way I think about it now is, it's kind of almost as if, you know, you get a personal trainer to knock on someone's door in January and say, hey, you know, you want to get fit, let's go work out. And you're kind of thinking, why did you show up here? Why are you trying to drag me to the gym? Like, yeah, I want that on the back of my mind, but I'm not ready. Versus the yeah. approach we're taking at Hunters is we're creating that content around the advantages of getting fit and healthy and strategies to mm. do a have a quick healthy breakfast in the morning and strategies to you know put your shoes on and see how you feel after you put your shoes on and then mm. take one extra step and you know those those types of creating that content in short video formats and distributing that to your target audience of course you don't get oh hey so and so from this company you know watch your video and here's their contact information and go get them that doesn't happen but what we find is that it's more you know, instead of the trainer coming to your door, it's more you're getting all of this information to your phone and to your computer and it's going around in your mind. And, you know, when that kind of the, you know, the penny drops um, one day when you're walking home from work, you think, yeah, you know what, I'm going to go and I'm going to call that personal trainer and I'm going to set up a, a, you know, a session for tomorrow and we're going to start mm -hmm. this. 
that in a business sense is yeah. way more effective because those are the deals that progress. Those hmm. are the deals that close. Those are hmm. the people that become customers. Hmm. Interesting. So you were saying again, though, that uh, you'd run this guide, you did it to a heavily targeted audience. And what you were doing in terms of the motion was as soon as the, the content was downloaded, you had an SDR follow up. And initially, it was effective at getting some initial meetings, it sounds like is what yes. you were saying, but it didn't really lead to strong pipeline, or if opportunities were created, a lot of those opportunities didn't end up closing. Is, is that kind of right? I mean, is that the do you guys have any metrics around that? I'm just kind of curious. Did you look at it from a conversion standpoint and say, okay, we got X amount of downloads, this many moved through the funnel, et cetera? Anything you could share around that just specifically? Not right now because I worked there a year ago. Um, we were tracking it very, very closely. And what okay. you would see is like huge number of opportunities created from that source. But you would see like people were getting stuck in our uh -huh. funnel. Like there would be an intro call. And people would see hmm. a demo, but there would there wouldn't be that kind of, you know, urgency to purchase the product. So that's that's kind of what we were seeing. So what what should the flow then be? I mean, with like, I mean, I guess we can talk about the whole gated ungated thing um, because it always seems to be a battle on LinkedIn and anywhere. Um, but what should the flow be for? I mean, what do you guys do now, for example? I mean, if you do run a gated piece of content, what is that after flow? Because I think that's really important. What happens after the content download? Is it straight into a nurture sequence as an SDR following up aggressively and trying to get a meeting. I mean, are you guys changing up the strategies now or, or what would you suggest to people thinking about running a guide to a given target audience and what that experience looks like after the download? So we just haven't been creating any guides. I think people have, we no, just stopped. We've stopped. So no this, more. we were creating guides, you know, for every persona and every vertical in every region of my last company. Interesting. And, really we were just seeing uh -huh. you know a huge amount of effort would go into like writing a guide and it's a static pdf right. people would get it but usually probably not read it because they're already thinking about the next thing i think that mm. is outdated at this point right it's kind of just been it's been done to an extent that people mm. are kind of bored of it so what we're doing at hunters instead is creating video content and a lot of this is because we didn't we didn't have the, mm. you know, or I would say we didn't have the resources to bring on an experienced content writer, you know, in series A, and then until you know very very recently, mm -hmm. which is four months after we raised series B, because good content writers are in huge huge demand; they're hard to get. Um, so 100%. we didn't have someone to create guides, first of all. And then second of all, the conversation with my CMO, um, mm. you know, she's fantastic to work with. And a lot of it comes down to she's just brutally honest, right? Like, does this work today? Is this a, a method that our consumers mm. want to consume content in guide format on PDF? And we kind of looked at each other and said, mm. no, I don't think so. I, I would ask her, how do you like to consume content? She would say <laughs> short video clips podcasts she would ask me i would say the same yeah. so that's kind of the approach that we've taken is mm -hmm. you know when we do long form video it's usually in the format of um we're not using the word webinar anymore we're doing like live q and a's because i think webinar is another term that has a huge mm -hmm. amount of fatigue associated with it after the pandemic so we're yep. we're kind of go moving away from the traditional webinar, here's slides, everyone goes to sleep, you know, that type of setup where now, mm -hmm. you know, get rid of the slides. Let's have a conversation just like you and I are having right now, where we ask each other questions. Exactly. It's really live. It's not, you know, pre-recorded. And then, you know, when people mm -hmm. say interesting things, which they most often do, we cut the clip and we say, hey, this is the most impactful or one of the most impactful moments from mm -hmm. this live Q&A, not webinar, and we're showing it to you on LinkedIn mm -hmm. so that it sure. catches your attention and in, in the 30 seconds, you know, in between meetings. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So then, so then it sounds like then in 2022, it's, um, and especially in comparison to your last company, it sounds like much of your focus on more brand awareness and delivering content, the ways that people want to consume it, doing a lot less direct response. Is there any direct response running that you guys are going to do on LinkedIn? I mean, are you guys thinking about conversation ads are still running some form of that? Or are you just saying, you know what, we're not going to do that 
to your point about what you just said, people like consuming more short clips or ungated content, short form blogs, things like that, things that answer top questions and pains that they're thinking about. Or is there, is there a mix that, that you're thinking about with respect to lead gen versus brand awareness? I think to start, like the, the primary goal we have at the beginning is like, we want people to hear about hunters. And I envision this, like you're hearing about hunters mm -hmm. for the first time, you're seeing one of these video ads, you're seeing something that's really easy to find and really easy to consume. And then I think gated mm -hmm. will come into play in terms of we're coming up with these virtual and in-person experiences um, that are they're creative. They're mm. things that, you know, you and I would want to attend. We would want to bring a, a plus one or a plus two mm. to an event like this. We would want to put it on our Instagram. We <laughs> want to talk about it on LinkedIn mm. with our friends. We're thinking about those types of experiences and they will mm -hmm. be gated for the primary reason that you need to give mm. your information to get invited to it or to like receive it. Um, I hope that we can talk again mm, in a few right, months time right. and I can tell you the specific details of like each one of these experiences because I think it will be really interesting. Yeah, I, I just I won't share right yeah. now because it's in the works. Um, but I, I think that's where I see yeah. Gated coming in, right? I see Gated as like, we're going to give you something that's very valuable or we want you to be mm -hmm. involved with something and you're going to give us your information because you're explicitly opting in, not because we're trying to cheat you out of your information because we want to drag mm -hmm. you into our sales funnel. Mm hmm. 100%. Yeah, I, I think that, yeah, I think it's very hard though for a lot of SaaS companies still today to make that switch. I think that's the biggest, the biggest issue, right? Because once you get hooked on driving content downloads and seeing conversions in a channel, and especially with a lot of sales or a lot of marketing teams rather that are still comped on MQLs and leads, it does make it very hard to rip yourself away from that. So I think that the key that, you know, bringing it back to the metrics that you guys are measured on is when you start looking at a measure of, you know, how much marketing source pipeline have we created? And then you start looking at the tactics that you're running on these channels and not just LinkedIn, but others, right? Then you have to say, all right, are these things ultimately leading to and affecting that gold more downstream? And that's where I think, you know, the foundational elements of, less focused on sitting here twisting dials and optimizing bid optimizations and testing endless copies of creative, et cetera, where getting the targeting right and making sure the segments are really, really detailed and that you've got content and messaging that's relevant to them. So to your point about the podcast with the highlights, making sure that those highlights are relevant to the people that you're actually gonna push that out to. So if it's just organically through a personal profile that you're connected with those individuals so they can see that content when they're following you, or if it's through a paid media uh, perspective that you've got really, really strong alignment there. And I think that's ultimately what's going to move the needle a lot more and where it's certainly we see at least a lot of Sescoms we work with, we're seeing those, those things definitely drive huge amounts of pipeline. Now, attribution, difficult always, right? But to your point about self, self-reported attribution, that's exactly what we do and recommend with a lot of our clients is to say, hey, listen, put up an open field text, see what they say. Obviously, we're going to know that it's not going to match as well to what you know HubSpot or Salesforce is going to say. But that's okay. We can use that for directional things. I mean, for yours, I imagine you guys get probably like, I listen to your podcast a lot, don't you? Not yet. I think, yeah. Really? I think not yet? Not yet. I think we're too early in our journey. And I think we need to, we're consistent, but I think the frequency needs to be raised. I think once a month is challenging. Mm. Um, but I hope again, I hope next time we speak, it's going to be more mm. podcast, more LinkedIn. Um, I honestly just don't think we've been doing enough. Just being really, really frank. We had a very lean team last year. Um, and we actually did a lot of in-person in Q4 just to see what in-person mm. was like. And if it, it lived up to the hype of what we remember it as pre 2020, um, mm. But really this coming year is, you know, podcast and digital amplification of content is going to be huge. Yeah, hundred percent. I want to, as we kind of get to wrapping up here um, and get you some dinner um, in terms of just the, uh, the tech stack that you guys are thinking about using. Um, have you guys made any new purchases from a technology standpoint when you think about um, whether you're doing any types of ABM plays or whether you're, uh, leveraging intent data to do better targeting like do you guys use a lot of tech or is it you know more so just really doing a good job on some of the foundational elements and not leveraging as much tech to get done what you guys need to get done how do you guys think about that 
I'm gonna make a brave and bold statement by saying we're we're close to like a zero investment in tech. Like we have our we have Love our it. marketing CRM, we have our sales CRM, you know, we have HubSpot mm -hmm. and Salesforce. Um, if anyone's ever heard of them. And you know, we're not we're Never. No. I don't know who they are. What are you talking about? Little little names in the industry. <laughs> um but we're not using anything for like yeah. we're not doing paid display. Um, we're not using anything else really out there. Like I've used a lot of these tools in the past and you know, there, there kind of was a sense in the market of like, you need to buy ABM tools to do ABM, um, you know, which is a complete lie, right? <laughs> what you need to do ABM, you need to have your salespeople talk to your marketing people and, you know, refocus on, on targeting mm -hmm. and messaging and creative and, and get out there and start doing things, right? You don't need to like evaluate tech and then onboard the tech and teach everyone how to use it and then fill it with whatever it needs, you know, to, to live. And those things, they huge financial investment, huge time investment. So we're trying to be as lean as possible. Mm -hmm. um, like I mentioned, we are bringing on an agency to help us with uh, LinkedIn advertising primarily just because you know, we're making that decision mm -hmm. rather than scaling out the team and other two or three demand gen people and bringing in experts for all those areas. It's really hard to get talent right now. Um, so I think working with an agency is yeah. smart and I'm sh sure you might agree with that statement. Yeah, yeah, I guess I'm completely yeah. biased on that. I mean, I think that there's there's always a, a time and a place. I think there's there's certain things you use agencies for and, and others not to. I mean, I'm, I'm a big proponent of uh, the content creation living inside the company, for example, and, and less outsourced there, because ultimately, I mean, unless unless there's an agency that somehow is an SME and understands your customer to the nth degree, fair enough. But I find that that's very hard to do. And I don't think there's many content agencies that actually spend their time just on one unique vertical. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe healthcare manufacturing's unique, but ultimately things like that have to stay internal. But yeah, when we're talking about, you know, implementation and getting conversion tracking and analytics and creating the creative and managing the channel and, you know, thinking about new things in it. I mean, those, those types of things can be outsourced as long as you've got the core foundational elements at the top, right? And I think that's where it's so important, you know, targeting, segmentation, messaging, content, all the other stuff that that agency is going to help with on the creative side and making sure the message gets delivered to those people. If those things are wrong up at the top, the whole entire program is not going to succeed. So I think that's where I think hopefully your agency, and I'm sure they are, spends a lot of time on that front end to really make sure they're super clear on what those things are. So that ultimately the program's a lot more successful. But, well, cool. Well, um, any questions for me before we, we kind yeah, of sign I do off? Have a question. So you mentioned, Good. and you're very correct, that it can be extremely difficult for larger companies or like more mature companies to kind of get off this, MQL hamster wheel um, that many of us either are on or have been on in the past. Like, do you mm -hmm. do you see it happen? Like, is it possible for bigger companies to get off that hamster wheel? Um, because in my experience, you know, I've been really fortunate in my current role. It's just been like a very early stage company, so I think it's kind of like you know, um, encouraging a certain behavior like from a very young age whether it's in like, you know, you're giving your dog these, uh, you know, you, this is how you the <laughs> discipline, I guess, or like, this is how we're going to do things. Like, it's very easy. Um, right. but, and it's very hard to teach an old dog new tricks if you want to stay with the same analogy. Um, but that, that was my question for you. hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, I think it, it is, it is possible. Um, the companies we work with, fortunately, a lot of them are not on that hamster wheel. Um, you know, yeah, they, or they've, they've di dipped their toe into it, but they're not completely committed. But I think the things are this, um, you know, if you're a company that is on that wheel and you are, um, ultimately measured on MQLs and you're calling MQLs content downloads and you're doing a ton of direct response on, especially paid media, but there's other channels you could do it on as well. Uh, the easiest thing to do is just to start looking into the CRM and understanding what conversion rates are through the funnel. And I think that's where you start and you say, hey, let's go ahead and tear this apart and say, how effective is this program? And I think this is where a lot of marketers don't end up following through. They say, hey, you know, we deliver the lead. It's sales job now to go take it over. I mean, I did my job, so they need to go convert an opportunity. I don't know why they're not converting those opportunities. So it becomes a game of pointing fingers. But the reality is that the marketers are responsible and they have way more control than they think of the funnel. 
Uh, clearly, it is a team effort, 100%. Sales has to do their job. But, you know, I think the biggest thing where I start is, again, just identifying what those conversion rates are. And normally what we'll see is that, you know, the conversion rates from a lot of those, what they're calling MQLs and typically their content downloads or like Legion forms on things like content, um, you know, are sub sub 1%. Uh, sometimes way, way below that in terms of conversion rates, looking at a very favorable, you know, timeline with respects to looking back into six months, 12 months worth of data. So when you start looking at that, then you're saying, well, wait a minute, like this isn't actually driving pipeline and revenue. And you show that to a CEO, then they're going to immediately start saying, well, wait, this is not a program we should continue running, you know, and then that's where it becomes a much harder uh, philosophical challenge uh, to decide what is the measure of success that marketing is going to have and how do we get in marketing and sales on the same measure of success? And I think that's where a lot of these issues stem from. It's not necessarily marketers are so guilty, but when they're told to drive more and more leads and they're given a CPL number that they have to hit, well, what are they going to do? They're going to, they're going to find cheaper ways to produce a lead. And when you use lead gen forms and content that's clickbaity, then you can get more of those into the funnel. But the reality is, is they don't close. So I think it comes back to, again, just understanding what's going on in the CRM describing that and, and showing that to whoever that marketer reports up to their CMO or ultimately really their CEO and CRO, and then having a sit down conversation to make sure, Hey, we got to get aligned on the same measure of success here. And I think the hard part for some companies, if they're really invested is they've got to now move away from uh, all the investments they made in massive SDR teams to then follow up on all of these leads. And I think that that's another issue too. Um, there's been also massive investments in MarTech, you know, that have facilitated, crazy waterfall nurtures that, you know, every little touch point is mapped out into this whole thing. And they've made such a massive investment in it that it is hard to pull away. But I think the numbers can't lie in the CRM. And ultimately, if things aren't leading to pipeline, it should be very obvious that we need to do something differently. Um, and the last thing I'd say about it is that you can't rip the Band-Aid of just turning that off. Let's say that there is alignment on the measure of success. You don't just completely stop doing those things. You do have to ease your way into it because a lot of the things that are going to need to be done in those channels are not going to be instant, like, let's get the lead right now. A lot of them are going to be brand building efforts, making your clients more aware of them, distributing content effectively to answer key questions. And those aren't always going to lead to inbound demo requests and pipeline immediately. So it does take some time. But we'll see, you know, within three, six months, people receiving, you know, 50, 60 percent increase in pipelines, sometimes more for smaller companies when you're talking about smaller pipeline numbers to getting very, very big. So, so that's what I'd say about that. But, yeah, it is difficult, no doubt. And I, I definitely uh, empathize with a lot of marketers that are in that position. So, I mean, if you're if you're in it, then you need to find a CEO or CRO that gets it and um, is, is on board or you need to show them the data. So I think it's as simple as that. But. Well, cool. Let's wrap up. Uh, thanks so much again for jumping on. Really appreciate it. I mean, uh, we'll have to do this again or maybe um, get some other folks on. But I guess I'd, I'd end it with one one quick question before we do jump, actually. Any any marketers that you'd recommend that come on this podcast next or anyone in demand gen that you really respect in the market? Actually, you know, one of my New Year's resolutions is to make more friends and build more relationships within demand gen. I feel like uh, because I've only worked for small startups, I've been, you know, the only demand gen person in the business. So I don't mm -hmm. have uh, a huge number of recommendations for you, but maybe we can work something out offline if I uh, look look yeah. through my contact book. I love it. I'm going to hold you <laughs> to it. I'm going to keep reaching out and asking you about it. Um, well, cool. Well, no, thanks so much again. And uh, we'll chat again, I'm thanks, sure. Thanks, Jonathan. It's a pleasure.